Hello, good evening and welcome to SLU. I'm Paul Cox and this is the latest edition, uh, of, uh, the latest episode of Practical Astronomy here at SLU. And don't forget, this whole series of shows, this weekly show, is all about uh, giving you the uh, opportunity to ask questions so that you can get the most out of your SLU membership. So anyway, I'm going to do the normal and just hop over to uh, the space situation room, which is where you should be watching at slu.com, just to make sure that uh, the show is broadcasting. And there it is. Jolly good. That's what we like to see. Uh, so happy Easter, if that's what you celebrate. Um, so yes, hopefully you've been eating lots of chocolate or doing whatever else you do on a Easter Sunday. Anyway, listen, what we're gonna have a look at first of all, let's take a look at the status of our telescopes tonight because I know they were online earlier, but look at this. They are all now showing red. So I went up to the telescope's sidebar navigation. Sometimes if the uh, telescopes have come online and then gone offline, this green icon kind of stays green unless you kind of have refreshed the page and then you see it. They're, they're offline, what a shame. So let's go over. So don't forget, telescopes are not online. All you gotta do is hop over to one of the telescope pages and you can scroll down and the place to uh, check this out is uh, obviously first of all see whether or not it's daytime or nighttime and there we can see it the yellow line here is uh, in the the, uh, the night time zone so it's dark we know it's dark and there's confirmation of it on the global map so the little red dot there that's where the canary islands observatory is just off the west coast of Africa, had that uh, dust storm, didn't we, last week? It's called La Calima, and it's because uh, that little west part of Africa has the Sahara Desert in it, and if the winds are blowing in the right direction, then it blows straight over the Canary Islands and can cause havoc. The last thing we want is uh, lots of Saharan dust and sand on the telescope optics and that's why we have to stay closed for that but uh, you can see down here as well there's the little uh, red spot marking the Chile observatory down there and all of these bands here they're just showing you uh, civil twilight and astronomical twilight and I think the other one is naval twilight or something isn't it and then you've got the hours of darkness you can see the moon there full moon hopefully you caught our blue moon show last night with uh, Dr Paige Godfrey and Helen Avery. That was a fun show. Uh, blue Moon. Who who would have thought? God, I wish I wish they really were blue. You know, it would be really cool. To, and I don't know if you saw that simulation I did. But anyway, let's take a look at the weather forecast. So here's the forecast: Sunday, light clouds to partly cloudy skies. So that's probably what's uh, happening. Weather's not looking great this week, is it? Chance of high humidity Tuesday. It looks like we've got a clear night tomorrow night. So. This might interrupt with one of those little projects that we've got on the go at the moment where we're watching Saturn, Mars, and the globular cluster M22. We'll take a little look and see what members are doing with that a little bit later on. But um, current conditions, here we go. This is what we really want. Oh, look at that. 79% humidity. And uh, the dew point temperature, by the way, that's uh, that turns yellow whenever it's, it's within, you know, kind of six degrees of uh, the ambient temperature, which is the top one, because whenever those two get close together, that's when humidity is high. It's just the temperature that dew can form. Um, we had some really high winds earlier as well, up to about 20 miles an hour, something like that. So some of those early missions that did run uh, may have been a bit windswept. Let's take a look at the satellite image. Yes, yeah, this one, we're going to change this actually. This is showing a certain type of water vapor. Um, and it would be better to show kind of the, the water vapor from clouds, really. So these are different uh, different bandwidths in the uh, infrared spectrum. Uh, mission status, don't forget, is where you can look up you know, what happened last night. So we had moderate to heavy clouds last night. So if you're looking at uh, some of those missions at the uh, in the second half of the night, my word, we, we were punished by the clouds, but we stayed open because they were a little bit patchy. But uh, let's take a look at the all sky tonight. This is the all sky camera so this is our special low light camera there we can see on the left hand side two white things with the black lines going through them those are the closest one to us is dome 2 which houses the canary 2 
wide field telescope that's a 17 inch telescope and also the uh, canary 2 ultra wide field telescope now it's a small um, refractor telescope which sits on top of the 17 inch telescope so whenever you book up a mission uh, for canary 2 you actually get two lots of uh, images and they're with different fields of view and maybe we'll look at that a little bit later as well but then you can see the uh, further dome there is dome 1 and that's got the canary one half meter telescope in it and the canary one half meter telescope is 20 inches um, that's the primary mirror that's what gathers up all of that light and then the canary two wide field is the same type of telescope but just three inches smaller so it's a 17 inch telescope that uh, you may know as well that of course and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on um, that they run different mission lengths. So Canary 1 has a mission length of 10 minutes and the Canary 5 has a mission length, sorry, Canary 2 has a mission length of 5 minutes. So uh, anyway, let's take a look at the time lapse because you'll see from the time lapse why we didn't have the solar telescope online today. So this is earlier on today. So you can see the, the clock ticking. That's midday local time. One, two, three. Every time I thought it was going to be clear enough to open up the solar telescope another band of cloud came in and then look sunset gets clear opened up the domes there they go and uh, looked like a great night and then suddenly all of this muck came across what a shame that was because it was looking like quite a good night even though it was a bit moonlit wasn't it so we'll see a little bit later what moonlit images look like there's the dome camera as well that's always a nice one in fact this you can see this if you have a look at the time lapse today we had it look at that we had it trained, not on the domes, uh, but we had it trained over to the eastern horizon. So this is overlooking the ocean. So don't forget, the observatory is at 8,000 feet altitude. So we're above all that mucky atmosphere. We don't want to look through atmosphere because atmosphere is turbulent and it destroys any kind of astronomical view through a telescope. But we trained it on the eastern horizon so that we could see that blue moon rise. Uh, yesterday evening and my word it looked good I hope you caught it but uh, it was still like it this morning so this is actually sunrise at the observatory and this is what I'm used to I've got the the best office view I always think in the world because I do a night's work and I always wait up there until you know the sun rises when I'm tidying away and stuff like that and it's the most beautiful thing to go from a dark dark night at a dark sky site like that into morning but uh, here we go there's the sunrise does a few funny things there's that neighboring island there of grand canary we're looking down on the atlantic ocean look at the way those lower cloud clouds uh, kind of bubble away underneath and that's actually why the canary islands are so good because there's what's called an inversion layer and it's when you get two regions of the atmosphere usually a colder and a warmer uh, layer and it's at those junctions that you normally get cloud formation and the inversion layer because we're getting in you know the, all of these clouds are sweeping in from the west and that's the prevailing winds that hit the canary islands from the west and all they've covered is 3,000 miles of smooth atlantic ocean and this means that the inversion layer um, is typically in the canary islands around 6,000 to 7,000 feet above sea level which means at 8,000 feet the observatory is normally above them and indeed we were above that layer but today with this other weather front that was coming in there's another higher level of cloud as well but uh, anyway always check those out if you want to see uh, check your uh, images in my pictures and if you see a couple of funny ones in there maybe strange colors or anything like that then hop over to the all sky time lapse mainly and then you can check the conditions of the previous night and it's always a really good way of uh, checking that let's have to take a quick look at the uh, horizon cam as well this is pico del tady cam i'm not sure whether this was uh, no that's still showing up from today so that one's stuck again so they need to get a tech going all the way up there another couple of thousand feet up onto the volcano so anyway uh, that's uh, that's the canary islands but how about conditions in Chile at the Chile Observatory today. Well, that's looking pretty good. There's the horizon cam. Now, I haven't often talked about this, have I? But um, this is the university's all-sky camera. 
and just like our one in the Canary Islands, it runs 24 hours a day. So we see it during the day as well. And uh, what we can see here is they've actually marked it west, south, east, and north. And this is on the roof of their museum, a little planetarium building. But what I'm pointing to over here now, this is their huge roll-off roof observatory where they had their two large telescopes in there. So at night, if you look at this view, especially if it's moonlit, you can normally see that this is open. It's pulled all the way back, although they don't operate as much as SLU does. But then the interesting thing in this view, and we'll probably see it actually, uh, yeah, we'll check the timing, but I think in 20 minutes time, it will be time to open the Chili Dome. And you can see the Chili Dome, where the SLU telescopes are, it's kind of cut in half. So right over here on the right-hand side, and that's one half of the dome. And then right over here as well, so we're due north from where this camera is, is the other half of the dome. We can actually see it better in the all-sky camera view. So when you're looking at this all-sky camera view for Chile, what we're seeing here is obviously there's the sky and we've got north is where the SLU dome is. And you can, you can actually see this when it's open because you can just about see here, you might not see it on the screen grab, but if you're looking at this on your own machine, uh, on the telescope pages, uh, you, you'll be able to see this in detail. You can actually see the two shuttles. So an hour before the first mission is when the domes open to cool down all the equipment because it's been really hot in Chile today. It's been a really hot, sunny day. So all of the equipment, the observatory is hot. And what we want to do is we need to cool all of the equipment down before missions start because when the telescope's hot, when the camera's hot, when the concrete, when the dome, when everything else is hot, you get all of this heat convected air and that's all turbulent and that really destroys the images as well. And sometimes uh, in the, at the Canary Islands Observatory, when at the height of summer, we never reach what's called thermal equilibrium. The equipment never reaches the same temperature as the ambient temperature at night. It just doesn't have the time to cool down sufficiently. But we open up an hour before, so that gives us, uh, uh, the sun's always set by then, and it gives us as much time as we can to uh, safely cool the equipment. But, but the other things in this view, over on the western side, uh, so that's to the right, uh, you can see that huge white long thing, which is a little bit corrugated, and that is the roof that you'll sometimes see open where the university's telescopes are peering out, lots of students using that. And of course, you can use the uh, time lapse as well for these, so you can check the sky. Uh, there you go, you saw it just then. So that's the same kind of view that we're getting now, but that's last night, you can see by the timestamp. And if we set it running, bang, did you see the dome open? I'll show you again, bang, there it goes, and uh, cools down, and actually, we even saw, I don't know if you saw that, but I actually saw the telescope move inside the dome. And it looks like we've got the uh, space station. Let's take a, take a look around this region and you should see a little flash. There it is, did you see it? And that's the space station. I expect, I'll, sh I'll show you how we can look that up. Uh, but uh, there's that bright moon and the bright moonlight really does wreak havoc with astronomical conditions, imaging conditions, because it's like, it just adds noise, background noise uh, to our images. So even though the sky can kind of look beautiful, that's just, you know, you'll see, we'll take a look at some of the chilly images um, from yesterday and under moonlight conditions, and we'll see uh, the kind of color tone that it puts, and we'll also see a kind of gradient going over the images as well but anyway what's where the forecast for tonight clear 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 look at that sunday monday tuesday we've got clear and uh, it's normally 48 to 78 hours is the most accurate part um of our forecast so uh, that's pretty good okay that's looking good um so what time is chile observatory opening so i just hopped over to the scheduled telescopes page to see tonight's schedule and it's 23:35, so that's just over an hour and 20 minutes away so at 35 minutes past the hour if you keep an eye on that uh, all sky camera view you'll see the chili dome open 
but uh, what, what have we got on here tonight? Oh, one of my favorites, but uh, it's an odd time. So here we go. We've got here, uh, got uh, Appendra D has scheduled the Tarantula Nebula. Um, now, the reason why I say it's a bit of an odd time, the Tarantula Nebula is a fabulous looking object um, to, to view at through the SLU telescopes. It's quite bright, but during the first, it's usually between, depending on the time of year, between 20 and 35 minutes of the night, we're still under astronomical twilight, which means the sky is still slightly bright. And we always recommend that people don't schedule um, faint nebula or galaxies um, during those twilight hours, because just like the moonlight, it, at twilight, the sky conditions make the images noisier. So the best things to schedule during, if you grab one of those first um, mission slots of a night or one of the last ones, the best objects to uh, view during that time are planets, if they're visible, or globular and open star clusters. In other words, very bright objects, and they're just not as badly affected as uh, some some of the faint nebulae under those um, twilight conditions. But you can see here another interesting thing, actually. We've got uh, Christina F. That's Christina Feliciano. She heads up the uh, CATS Comet Monitoring Group. And uh, I think Christina is setting out to try and uh, recover uh, Comet, I think it's 46P. So have a look over in on the CATS Comet Group uh, in discussions. And Christina, I think, has written something in there, what she's trying to get. When I talk about recovering a comet, so the name is 46P. The P means that it's a periodic comet. And a periodic comet is one that's usually within the orbit of Jupiter and is orbiting on usually quite an elliptical path around the sun. And then depending on you know, uh, what its period is, it can go really far out into the solar system and then back in again if it's on a long period. But a periodic comet is something that's considered um, to have a period of 200 years or less. In other words, it comes back in to do another orbit around the sun. And when it's closest to the sun, it's called perihelion. So it does that you know, in less than 200 years. So 46P, when we talk about the recovery of that comet, we're saying nobody has actually seen this comet on this apparition. And an apparition is either for a planet, in fact, it can be for any celestial object. It's like it's viewing season. So when it comes to planets, that happens about nine months of every year. So we're coming up to the middle of the uh, Jupiter's apparition this year. So it's, we see it for longer and longer each night. And then it's out of, uh, out of sight for two or three months when it's too close to the sun. So it doesn't appear in the night sky. But with a comet, a comet's apparition is just when it comes into view. So in other words, when it comes into the inner solar system, in our neck of the woods, in other words, it's when we can see it, then it does its close approach to the sun, that perihelion, before it then whizzes around and gets flung back out into its elliptical orbit and into the outer solar system. So a recovery is, in fact, a couple of members have already done this. I think Jonathan T did this early on in the year. Um, they're the first person, a comet recovery is the first person to spot a periodic comet on its next journey into the solar system. So nobody's seen 46P yet. And I have just noticed actually that Christina thankfully has, has actually labeled her, her missions there. So they're celestial coordinate missions and you can see the coordinates that she's looking at, but then you can see in brackets, she's put 46P. So that's what Christina's doing at the moment. And this is, in fact, we'll, we'll check this out, but I think it's only visible from the Southern Hemisphere, which is probably why she's using the Chile Observatory. Um, but we'll, we'll check that out. But she did email me yesterday to say it's it's just coming you know, far better into view. It's around 30 degrees, I think she said, above the horizon uh, in that half hour before dawn. So 
what Christine is doing is she's trying to image a very, very faint object, but she's chosen those very mission slots during astronomical twilight that I was saying, no, don't, don't image, don't try and capture faint objects during that astronomical twilight. But this is the only time when that comet could be seen at the end of the night in those twilight conditions. So what we used to say was we used to ask members, please leave those beginning slots and those end slots, mission slots every night on all of the telescopes. Please leave those for people who are trying to capture asteroids and comets and other objects, supernova may, may be, um, that aren't visible at any other part of the night. So that means uh, for the first mission slots, it means things that are setting in the west shortly after, after sunset. And in this case, the uh, morning, the pre-dawn slots, those are actually uh, capturing objects which are rising in the east uh, just before sunrise. So that's why you sometimes see a lot of our members trying to capture comets and asteroids at those times. And of course, when these objects are really low on the horizon like this, and uh, you, you might notice actually, uh, have a look, make sure you catch any of uh, Emmanuel Conseil, so Emmanuel C, any of his missions, because he's a supernova hunter and he's discovered supernovae and nova, quite a few of them with sluice telescopes. And a lot of the time you'll see Emmanuel using those slots at the beginning and end of the night. And why Emmanuel does it is because he's trying to view objects like the Andromeda Galaxy maybe when it's really low on the horizon because that's where the professional surveys can't go. A lot of those professional surveys don't and can't go that low to the horizon. So unfortunately, these pro big professional surveys have, have somewhat reduced the ability for amateur astronomers to make discoveries of comets, of asteroids, and of supernova. But if you box a little bit clever, like Emmanuel, you can actually r reach those or, or search in those areas of the sky where those professional um, telescopes can't actually go. But to, anyway, so we're going to take a look at that. But let's hop over now. We always do our little stop off, don't we, over in the community. And up to, let's go to the most recent. Actually, we'll go to featured threads first of all, see what's going on. Don't forget, if you want me to cover anything in particular on these Practical Astronomy series, then uh, just say, just post into uh, the, the courses. So if you go over to courses and you go down here to Practical Astronomy, just make a post in here. And in fact, we've got a question in there from Peter D and we're going to answer that. Um, actually, no, it was, it was the other one that we were going to answer. It was, uh, I think it was Glenn or GL here. When is the best time to snap pictures? So I was hoping that we'd be able to have some live missions to be able to do that but if you ever want me to cover anything put them in here and uh, i'll do my best to uh, feed it into the next the next uh, show the next live cast so anyway this is featured threads so everybody's keeping an eye open for china's Tiangong one space lab i talked about that in our show last night uh, do take out do check the uh, my progress on the messier marathon poster because a couple of other members are uh, trying that out. We've got Christina there. She's caught this lovely little comet. In fact, let's take a quick look at this uh, because Christina has captured this great little comet. Um, so there it is. It's the stack. I think there was an animation of it as well, but look at this. So look at that as a classic little comet. So there you can see, you know, the, the you can really see the two elements, the two visual elements of the comet here. So the bright spot there, uh, you can see up in this top right hand image as well so um, you might see this better if you go into discussions yourself and look at the image actually i'll tell you what to do because i had a question of, of this earlier on in the week if you want to see more detail in uh, an image that somebody's posted here all you've got to do you don't have to do it from the full size one but you can do just right click on the image and say open it in a new tab and when you open it in a new tab you see it at full size. So look, you can then click on it and then you can see it at full size. So that's an, a useful little tip. So what Christine has done here is she's kind of magnified this bit of the, the image and she stacked lots of images together, which is why all the stars are kind of a bit streaked there. 
and uh, we're going to cover all of that in our image processing courses. But there is this lovely classic looking comet. And the two parts of it that we can see at the moment is, first of all, you can see what's called its coma. Now, a coma can be enormous, thousands and thousands. And I think there have been some comets where it's been a million miles across. But the coma is hiding what's called the comet nuclear. So we're not actually seeing the actual lump of ice and rock and dust, which is the actual comet. Because what's happening is all of that ice is doing what's called sublimate. And when ice sublimates, it turns immediately from ice to gas. It doesn't go through a liquid form. And that's what sublimation is. And so all of this ice bursts, pulls dust off as it sublimates off the, uh, the surface of the comet. And sometimes you can see big jets coming out of it as well. In fact, Christina caught some great jets coming out of, I think it was Comet 67P, or maybe it was one of the other ones she was monitoring. But anyway, so that's the coma. And, and it's this, this um, head of um, dust and gas uh, that's been blown off uh, the surface of the comet. And it kind of forms this huge ball around the comet nucleus. But then what's happening to that is it's being pummeled by the solar wind. And that's stripping a lot of that gas and dust off um, into what we see as a comet's tail. So when you look at a comet like this, you always know where the sun is in relation to the comet, because the tail of a comet is always pointing away from the sun. So that's always a really nice thing to be able to do, an easy thing to be able to do uh, when you see a comet. And of course, sometimes we get to see two tails. We get the type one tail, we get the type two tail. So this is really about the dust and the gas. Um, and what we get is that same solar wind kind of excites some of that gas, um, strips it of electrons, and we land up seeing the gas tail. And they're, they're basically, um, because they're different size particles from the dust, they're affected by the solar wind in a slightly different way, which is why those two tails, sometimes we see them separate out. But uh, anyway, so there's plenty to look at um, with comets. So that's a really good one. So if you want, um, if you want to take a look at this, what did, uh, what did Christina use? So this is comet C2015-01 Pan-Star. So you'll see there that that doesn't have a P in the name of it, other than the pan stars bit. But it's not like 41 or 46 P, which Christina's going for tonight. So what we know by this name is that C, it's a comet. Yep, got you so far. You can forget the forward slash. 2015 is just the year that it was discovered. And then the O and the 1 just define what fortnight and which order, how, how the order of discovery. So this was the first comet discovered in a particular fortnightly period. In the brackets, PanStars is just the uh, discoverer of that comet. And Christina here has used the T2 Wide Field Telescope, so that's the Canary 2 Wide Field Telescope, and she's put here all of the information because what Christina is doing here, in fact, look, you can see down here actually that she's been working with other members Bern Gluckenhona, he's uh, been a comet hunter as well with Stu for a number of years, and Bern uh, really captures some faint, faint uh, comets. I think that's Richard Tyson there as well, um, who's all part of the uh, Cats comet group. So if you are interested, or think you might want to be interested, or could get interested in comets, I'll tell you, they are very satisfying things to do. There's another image uh, that uh, Christina's done. Then. All you've got to do is hop over to member research and hop over to the CATS comet group. And it hasn't been very active because Christina had to take a little break from SLU for a while, but uh, Christina is back. So if you want to get involved, maybe with the, um, the, the next comet campaign, trying to track down comet 46P, then uh, just post something in here and Christina will guide you in how you can get involved. And some of that 
is just about contributing missions. So, you know, just as we saw, you know, with that, with this one here, several members have got together to contribute missions to the same object. And then they put all of their data together so that they can get a far, far better image like the one that we're seeing now. So you don't have to get into doing all of these image productions and stuff like that, although it's great if you want to do that. But that's what those groups are, are, are good at doing. They'll teach you from the ground up, but straight away you can start participating just by uh, putting together a, a mission. So anyway, that's uh, that's the comic group. Uh, let's take a look. Let's go back here because there was another thing that I thought was really quite cool at the moment, which I skipped over. But here we go. Saturn and Mars meets Globular Cluster 22. Now, make sure you check out this thread because it's something that we're enjoying in the pre-dawn hours. We've already had um, we've already had Mars meeting the Lagoon Nebula, if you remember, and the Trifid Nebula. And now it's passing between um, or it's passing very close to M22, which is a globular cluster, which you can see at the bottom of this shot. And you'll see Saturn at the top. And I posted this originally saying Saturn meets globular cluster M22. And then last week I suddenly spotted that Mars was going to join the party. So here we go. I posted this update and there we can see Mars is uh, coming in between them as well. Uh, so what's the other image I have? There you go. So there's just the mosaic that we're watching every night. And a few members have already put some of these together. So this was the first night that David Malik um, put together this image. And grayscale is really good for this particular image rather than color because the Saturn and Mars are incredibly bright objects um, for this kind of telescope and this kind of mission. So you can see that it kind of burns out a lot of the sky. And when it's in color, you get quite a lot of color gradient. But look, we can't see Mars in this. So there's Saturn at the top. We can see Messier 22, that glorious globular cluster down at the bottom. But Mars hasn't yet joined the party. So let's hop down. Uh, we've got Larry, actually, Larry T uh, put together uh, the color version of that. And you can see some of these gradients that we've got in the sky. Um, but it's still a fabulous image, isn't it? So uh, Larry's already practicing putting together several images um, so we've got uh, Timothy put one together as well. Uh, we can see the glare from Saturn there. Actually, I, uh, that's really cool, actually. That's a really nice image. Look at all the stars in that image. We've got another one here from Guy. Uh, so let's see how much trouble it gives us joining up these images smoothly when we've got such bright objects in there. Um, I think uh, David then has done a second one here. So is Mars in this? No, still hasn't appeared. But look over here to the right of this image. You can see it looks a little bit brighter, doesn't it? And I think that is Mars coming into the shot. But what caught my eye this morning when we looked at this was this added bonus. I had no idea we were going to pick up. And I think this is a first for SLU. So look at this image. I'm going to open this up in a new um, tab so you can see this closely. So look, and you can see that that is Mars coming in on, on the right hand side, but not fully in view. But there's the globular cluster down at the bottom. But there's Saturn up in the top. And of course, the planets move against the background stars, whereas globular clusters and galaxies and nebulae don't move against the background stars. But let's zoom in a little bit. Now, hopefully you can see this. If you can't see it on my screen, then you will be able to see it if you open up this image yourself. But look at that. So the, the, the really bright thing, that is Saturn moving back and forth from one night to the next night. So this is an animation between two nights. But look here, we can see a little spot moving with Saturn. And I scratched my head when I saw this this morning. I thought, what on earth is that? And I thought it would be too much of a coincidence that an asteroid just happens to be traveling at virtually an identical speed across the sky as Saturn is. And uh, then somebody put an answer in here. So let's take a look. I think it was, so Guy is, is spotted this as well. So he's done some processing. Um, and is that a moon of Saturn I see moving just to the west of the planet? And then Larry T 
said, I believe so, yes, specifically. Eupetus, um, Titan is lost in the bloom of the planet, but may get enough separation. And I did a little check later on. Donald did, uh, did a, another uh, mosaic pinned together there. But I took another look today at the star charts and I came up with this. So here we can see the Canary 3, which is the yellow box. That's the Canary 3 Deep Sky Astrograph Telescope. That's the field of view. So that's the top panel of our mosaic. And look what we've got marked here. So there's Saturn. And there, just about where we're expecting it, is Eupetus. And I think that's how you say it. Eupetus? Iapetus? Yeah, Eupetus, I think. Um, anyway, I'm sure people will write in and tell me I've pronounced it all wrong. But we know what we're talking about. But anyway, I think that's an absolute first. I don't think we've ever captured that moon or many of Saturn's moons um, other than uh, other than Titan. So uh, that's um, that's the first, isn't it? Uh, and by the way, you then got down here. Guy has done a, um, a another animation which includes the third night where Mars does enter the field. So over the next couple of nights, we've got missions set up and you can follow these and we'll see Mars will actually overtake uh, Saturn and go to go out of the image to the left, go out of the field of view to the left, well before Saturn does. Why? Well, because Mars's apparent motion in the sky is a lot faster than Saturn's. Why? Well, it's as simple as Mars is a lot closer to us. So as it orbits um, the sun, its apparent motion in the sky is a lot, lot faster from our perspective than Saturn. So anyway, some really cool images. So keep an eye open for um, more of these. We did actually have some canary, uh, so, sorry, some chili missions set up for that as well. And in fact, uh, David M then put together, I think, another time lapse here. Uh, oh, Richard T's done one as well. Ah, oh, right, and David's actually uh, identified, put a little arrow uh, pointing to the moon as well. I really do think that the uh, grayscale images for these um, work out you know, really quite nicely. But isn't this fabulous? Is it just me? But there we've got. So what we're looking at here is an incredibly rich star field. And all of the stars that we see in this image are in the Milky Way galaxy. The globular cluster down at the bottom, Messier 22, well, that's this densely packed city of stars, of ancient stars. These are some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. And that globular cluster actually orbits our Milky Way galaxy. They quite often are not orbiting in the same plane, the same galactic plane as the spiral arms, but they're often orbiting around, so up above and then down below the galaxy. So that's what we're seeing there. But then we're seeing the mighty ring giant Saturn. So we're seeing one planet move from night to night in the sky. And don't forget, you know, the word planet comes from the Greek for wanderer. That's what they were looking at. So they were looking at these wandering stars. That's what they thought they were seeing. So there we're seeing not only just the ring giant, but one of its moons as well. And then joining the party, we've got Mars, a second planet entering this same field. I mean, I can't remember seeing anything quite as interesting as this in a composition ever before in 14 years of Mars. I know we had um, we had two main belt asteroids. I think it was um, Ceres and, and one other with Mars, and they were all in the same field of view uh, for a few nights. But I can't ever remember a composition like this. So we really are very, very fortunate. And it was just by chance that I noticed that Mars was going to join this particular party. So let's just take a look at Richard's version here. Another grayscale one. So liking that Richard a lot. So uh, very nice. I should think your Saturn actually is over the top of the moon. So anyway, good. So keep an eye on that. In fact, that example was from uh, Chile One. So that's interesting. So uh, Richard has used the Chile One uh, telescope. And you know, we we could mix and match between the Chile One uh, ultra-wide field 
Um, I, I think that's labeled wrong. I think this is the Chile one ultra wide field, uh, which the names have changed over the years. Um, and the Canary two ultra wide field. They've got roughly the same kind of field of view. So uh, anyway, keep an eye open for that because that's pretty darn spectacular. I don't know if you uh, if you agree with me or not, but um, anyway, what else have we got? Let's take a quick look at the most recent. See if there's anything here that I've missed. Audio volume, oh dear. Are you gonna tell me that the audio volume is low tonight? Oh, you need to make sure that your volume, well, it is cranked up all the way. Um, I can try one little thing because something does sometimes happen, unfortunately. On machines, you know, when they try and, um, they try and get a bit uh, clever and alter the volumes. Oh, okay, so that has turned up quite a bit. I hope I haven't suddenly shocked you all, but unfortunately, that was my sound I had uh, automatically gone down. So hopefully, you can hear me now. Sorry about that, David. Um, computers up and ready to go. Good thing I had to say later viewing on my big screen. I haven't experienced any buffering issues yet. Oh, that's a good thing. Well, I, I closed down quite a few apps that I was going to show you tonight uh, on the screen. But uh, anyway, let's take a quick look, make sure there's nothing else there. Uh, Ganymede Trans. Oh, that was cool last night, actually. Uh, take a quick look at this um, because this was something I wanted to show you. So this is Juan Pablo. He, he noticed this and this is uh, Glenn had booked the missions for this. And what we can see here is the moon Ganymede right at the very top of Jupiter's disk there. So that little kind of bubble, that little wart on Jupiter is uh, moving uh, from one side to another. So Juan Pablo has aligned those images and you see the other moon here, that's Io over there. So uh, in fact, I, let's, um, we got time wise i can't really show you about the the best time to snap images so i think we're going to do that next week when we've got live missions because i really want to show you that while we've got uh, live missions but what i did want to show you tonight was and i noticed this in, on the home page because somebody had shared one of their images from chile so this is ivan r shared this one. Oh, look, that's a nice trifid, isn't it? Nice Saturn. Some of the um, some of the missions last night, planetary missions to Saturn and Jupiter at Chile were superb. And I just wanted to show you very quickly once again, I have shown you how to do this once before, but I thought it was worth showing you on this particular image. And I'm just going to save this image. This is the one that, uh, oops, um, I need to download, right click, save as, and then we're going to pop that into the folder there. And I want to show you how much you can improve your images. So if you didn't see this before, this is some, um, this is a kind of a little miracle that uh, you get to see um, on your planetary images. So here we've got standard piece of image processing software. Um, I'm just gonna drag that. This particular image processing software I'm using is uh, PaintShop Pro, but you can use the online GIMP. You can use uh, Photoshop if you've got Photoshop. But there is this lovely image of Saturn. In fact, it's not the, the best one that I saw last night, but let's just take a look at how we can improve it. And the best way that you can improve a planetary image is doing what's called adding some unsharp masking. You can use sharpen. So if we just use sharpen there, you can see it kind of added on a little bit of detail. If we do sharpen more, adds on a bit more detail. But more effective for this is an unsharp mask. So we're going to do an unsharp mask. And you can see, look at this, that's without it. That's with it. Look at how the moons pop into view over here. They suddenly pop out and we see lots more detail in the actual planet just by adding a little bit of unsharp um, mask to it. Now, you can overdo this. And if you overdo it, you actually start introducing what are called image artifacts. So let's put 400 on there. Look at that. You can see it's generated lots of noise in the image and actually introduced features that just aren't there. So always be a little bit cautious with how much you uh, apply. 
And uh, what I told you a couple of weeks ago, actually, was um, the better the image, the beginning image that you start off with, the more you can sharpen them. So that's for planetary images. In fact, with um, with nebulae and, and other um, and galaxy images, sometimes you want to soften them. You want to kind of do the opposite of that. But anyway, that's just a real quick explanation of how you can improve your um, your SLU planetary mission images really quite easily. So uh, let's uh, hop back over to here. What are we going to look at here? Transition. You wouldn't believe how many windows we have to have open to do one of these shows. <laughs> so there we go. So what we're going to do, the question that was asked uh, last week was, um, it was about when to snap images. So the best way of dealing with that is for me to actually show you that while we've got the telescopes online. So that's what we'll do next week. We'll keep fingers crossed that the telescope's gonna be online for us next week and we'll work through that, which leaves us a little bit of time now. So I've already told you uh, how you can get involved with uh, comments by going to the discussion boards, going to member research, going to the CATS comment group. But why don't we take a little reminder um, of how you set up a mission to a comment. So the first thing, if you remember, we have to do is find out where the comet is in the sky, its coordinates. And just like we saw Saturn and Mars moving against the background stars. Uh, so things like the, the Messier 22, that globular cluster, its coordinates never, ever change. They always stay the same. Well, over the course of our lifetime, certainly over the course of quite a few lifetimes, in fact. But the planets, we've seen that the planets move against background stars. Well, so do comets, because once again, they're close to Earth and we know that they're orbiting the sun. And they change depending on their relationship to us. And in fact, they do slow up and speed up, speed up, speed up and slow down, depending on where they are. They usually speed up as they're whipping around the sun at their uh, little tight bit of their elliptical orbit. Um, but we need to find out what the coordinates are. So what we're going to do here is, and you can look at actually one of the, um, one of our other shows for the alternative uh, means that you can use uh, to get a comet's coordinates. But for tonight, we're going to use planetarium software. And this is something I was thinking about. Uh, whether or not you'd like me to cover more in this practical astronomy series. So I'm going to pose the question to you. Would you like me to cover various bits of astronomy software? So planetarium software, image processing software, um, online resources, stuff like that. Um, we've got some other great little programs that show you the lunar phase. Uh, another one that tells you, you know, all of the objects that might be up at a certain time. If you want me to cover some of that, then just shout out and uh, I can do that really quite easily. That would be, I think, a good topic for some shows. But here we are with some planetarium software. So all this is doing is it's giving us a virtual look of our sky. So there we go. It's kind of a little bit like our all sky camera, isn't it? It's the same kind of view. I'm just going to switch off all these star names, get rid of those. So, uh, and that's the great thing with these programs. You can change um, what they show all the time. So you can see there at the moment, I've got uh, all of the constellations switched on. Uh, I've got the ecliptic. So that's that big blue line going through the middle. So that's the apparent path of the sun through Earth's sky. And because uh, the moon and the planets are in that same uh, layer, that same zone, that's where we see the planets as well. So we can see down here, Jupiter is just rising there as well. So, but you can also see, I've got some M numbers there. So those are the Messier objects. I'm going to switch those off because we don't want those for now. We can also see that I've got some comet shown here. But look, I think that's the one, isn't it? Isn't that the one that we want? 2015 01 it is indeed there we go 
So uh, this is one that Christine has been looking at that showed that great little tail at the moment. But there are a few things that you need to check in your planetarium software um, before, um, let me just get rid of that little bit of background for you like that. Um, there's a couple of things that you always need to check whenever you go in to your um, planetarium software. And the first thing is that it's set up for your location because the view that you get of the sky changes depending on where you are in the world. I know that might sound obvious to some of you, but some people might not know that. And it's not always obvious when you start off in astronomy. So in this particular um, planetarium software, and it's the same kind of principle for most, you just, uh, this is, I'm using the sky X and I'm just going to pick location. And I've already got in here um, our observatories and other places where we've been. So we've got uh, Indonesia where we did uh, the eclipse down there. We've got Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, where we've done quite a few shows from. Uh, got a whole number of places there, South Africa, Siding Springs in Australia. But here we go. We can see already at the top that I'm already set to SLU Tady Observatory. And if you need these details, then all you got to do is hop over to the website, hop over to the telescope pages and I think it's on the reverse of these if it's not I apologize there you go so at the bottom of every telescope card it tells you there you go the latitude the longitude and the altitude uh, for time zone just keep to UTC which we discussed I think last week or the week before so anyway We've done the location, so that's the first thing we need to set in our planetarium software. The second thing is the time. So at the moment, I'm just gonna set to the computer clock and you can see it ticking forward here, but then I can stop the clock because I, can, I wanna see when this particular comet is gonna be best placed. So let's take a look tomorrow night. So I'm just gonna change the date. So that's the 2nd of April. And uh, let's put it on to rough hour. In fact, the other thing I'm going to do here is I am going to reload these comets just to make sure that we've got, um, and, and once again, most of the planetarium software works in the, it, roughly the same way. You have to load comets and asteroids up. And I just want to make sure that I've got the very latest um, orbital elements uh, for all of the comets. So I'm going to load those and this is coming from the Minor Planet Center and when we say orbital elements that's exactly the kind of work that people like Christina, Bernd Luckenhoner and also the Near Earth Asteroid Group, the A-Team, that's what they're doing. When they observe one of these objects they measure its precise location against the background stars and they send a report to the Minor Planet Center. And that means that we can account for these small changes sometimes that we see in the orbits of comets and asteroids. And it's called determining their orbits. So that's what we're really doing. But anyway, so we've got the latest. We know that we've got the latest. So there it is. Where is it? It's um, altitude. We've got down here, 23 degrees. We don't want to be imaging that comet when it's so low down because Later on in the night, if we push it forward by an hour, it's going to get higher. Push it forward by another hour, it's even higher. And forward another hour, it's even higher. So what we can't do is we can't image it when it's there. So when it crosses what's called the meridian, which is this imaginary line that goes from the north horizon through zenith, which is the point directly overhead, then down to the south horizon, we can't image because the telescopes can't really point within half an hour of either side of that. So I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a mission for 2.30. So 02.30 UTC. And over here on the left hand side, you can see these coordinates. And if I change the time again, you can see that those coordinates change. Even better if we zoom in on the object. And uh, let's just make sure we've got a field of view here, because let's set up a mission on Let's say Canary 2. So let's see the Canary 2 field of view. And once again, I was using Starry Night Pro yesterday, uh, another planetarium software. They all work in roughly the same kind of way. So there we go. We can add fields of view. So there we can see the comet. And that's the field of view where it's going to be on the 3rd of April 0230. If I move the time forward and backwards, 
you can see how much the comet moves in an hour. So there you can go. That's how much it moves over the hour. So great if you want to set up um, set up a, a, a comet uh, animation, time lapse animation. But anyway, uh, have we got time? Right, let's set up really quickly um, a comet coordinate mission. So over here, for my coordinates, I like to enter these in in decimal format because it's just quicker. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to uh, I'm going to copy the name actually first of all because I like to do that. I just right clicked on it. Then we're going to go over to the telescope page and we're going to go to Canary Two. We're looking at did we say tomorrow night? So that's going to be that's the third. So it will be this the night of the second which is that night so that's where you have to kind of get this right um, and we're going to hop down to 230 and let's hope that slot is available if not we can change it a bit so that slot is available there it is we can say enter coordinates don't forget it's only astronomer members who can set up uh, coordinate missions if you remember i right clicked on uh, the comet's name so i can pop that in there uh, pan star should be written like that and then I want to hop over here and get the right ascension coordinates copy paste and if you use copy and paste it means you don't make any mistakes and the reason why I like using the decimal degrees rather than what's called the sexagesimal which is the hours minutes seconds and degrees minutes and seconds is that you've only got one entry to make so there you go just pasted it in there declination same thing copied that over here into there the next thing we have to do is say check visibility good news the object is visible at this date and time and judging from christina and burns and richard's images there um, it is a pretty faint comet so we will go with the faint galaxy or comet processing option and that will just pull out more of the detail of its tail um, in fact no i think we'll go for something else on this so if you were interested in the pngs and you wanted a color image then that would be the one to go for but if you wanted the deepest possible image to get out as much detail as possible well that's what these other recipes are for down here so this is multi luminance 50. now luminance just means it's not a color filter it's not a clear filter because it does filter some infrared out but uh, the luminance filter is going to give us a grayscale image and it's going to take as many 50 second exposures as it can during that mission so what we've done here is we've said that's my target name and as it says there it's optional but it's always nice to let other members know what we're putting in we've got our ra and declination our coordinates in there let's just uh check our timing's right, 0230, and this is going to be on the 3rd, so going back to our planetarium software, so that's correct. And we've then selected the processing option. We want schedule mission. And then, of course, we can add our tags as we like. You know me, I'm a great one for tags. I like uh, adding, oops, I like adding any that uh, I've done during shows. Absolutely. So that's in there, in there, and that's it. We're all scheduled up. Now, if you want some images of that same comet, all you've got to do is use the uh, auto save to my pictures. So when you're looking at my mission there uh, on Monday night, uh, you'll see automatically add those images uh, to your my pictures and you can just click that and you'll get images of that comet as well well you can hear by that clock that uh time has just about run out on us tonight so i'm sorry that uh, the audio was a little bit um dull earlier on but uh, do let me know in uh community on the discussion board so hop over there and don't forget go over to loading 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 Go over to courses, go over to practical astronomy, and you can just post in here and say what you'd like me to cover. And do um, answer that query that I gave you earlier on. 
you know, do you want me to cover various types of astronomy related software? I think that would be an absolutely ideal thing for us to cover during these. Let's just take a look what Anthony's written. Uh, Anthony's had the same issue, had to come back somewhat just now. And uh, so new, I haven't found how to start a new thread. I was going to tell Paul a while ago another thing about temps within six degrees of dew point a long time ago in pilot training. Oh, you're a fellow pilot, Anthony. I am one too as well, an aerobatic pilot. A long time ago, Anthony, pilot in training, they say that you will likely also expect to see fog when the temp lowers within six degrees of dew point indeed. So, uh, you know, and that's why we uh, have to close up the observatories. Let's just check those conditions once again before we turn in on this uh, Easter Sunday. Let's have a look at the current conditions. Yeah, there you go. Look, we're now within three degrees. The dew point is now within three degrees of the ambient temperature and humidity is 89%. So that's when we normally start seeing. Yeah, there you go. The whole observatory is is basically enveloped in the cloud. It's not kind of below the cloud. It's kind of enveloped within it. So uh, that's why uh, Canary Islands is offline. But we saw earlier that Chile was looking quite good. There's the Chile All Sky camera still looking good. And there you can see the dome is already open for us there. So anyway, uh, I will see you back here next Sunday. Don't forget, let me know what you want me to cover while we have the live telescope views next week. Um, we'll go into far, far more detail about when to snap your images, exactly what's going on um, while the image, uh, sorry, while the um, while the mission is, is actually underway. And I'll tell you what's really happening at the observatories. And that will kind of give you the full picture of when the best time is to um, to capture those images. We also have, by the way, a very, very active sun at the moment. I don't know if you spotted this. We weren't able to open today because it was cloudy. But uh, if we go through uh, my photo roll, we should have some of the snaps that I made the other day. That's some of the affected ones in the cloud last night. Oh, those great uh, moon photos that we got uh, from last night, Blue Moon. But here we go. Here are some of the uh, some of the shots that we got from the solar telescope a few days ago. Now, all of these prominences, these huge streams of uh, gas and dust, uh, sorry, gas plasma uh, coming off the limb of the sun. Um, they when they spin into view and those are those are going to come into view. So they were probably kind of more on the disk of the sun today. And we would have seen those as filaments in that case. But these look to me like two very active regions and they are going to now come into view on the face of the sun. So keep your eyes peeled for uh, the solar telescope to be online during daylight hours um, at the Canary Islands because we should be in for quite a treat. So we might see some huge filaments. We might see some sunspots and plages and all manner of other solar features. And if we do see that, I'll uh, probably pop online and do a little session to explain what some of those are during the week. So keep your eyes open for that telescope button to turn green during daylight hours. So it comes online about um, 8 a.m. Eastern time, about midday UTC, something like that. So uh, sometimes a little bit earlier. But anyway, that is all from me for tonight. Paul Cox with this latest episode of Practical Astronomy. Sorry about the sound issues. I'll kick my machine into not thinking that it's cleverer than I am. It keeps telling me what it wants, what I want its volume set to rather than uh, taking what I take. So anyway, uh, don't forget, we got to, uh, the very last episode of Dr. Paige Goffrey's Intro to Astronomy course. I think that's on Wednesday. And Helen Avery is going to be back with another Constellation story next Sunday night after my Practical Astronomy show. And Helen is going to be dealing with, she said last night, it's going to be Ursa Major. So that's going to be an interesting one. Um, some great, some of my favorite objects. 
up in that northern region of the night sky, some great messy objects, some great galaxies. So anyway, all from me for tonight. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'll see you again next week. Goodbye for now. <laughs>